Thanks, Abby. Um, Abby approached me probably in December, knowing that uh, she had this opportunity to have the space um, to curate, and I was super honored and grateful and um, for her generous offer because uh, it's not always easy to do shows. And um, when I was offered this, my very first thought was Jeff because we'd had a conversation in probably 2019 of. Um, you know, all of his amazing photographs and his aspirations for a beautiful coffee table book. And um, it's like, how do you get yourself into uh, exhibits and galleries? And it's not easy. And so as soon as this opportunity came up for me, I thought, um, I have to have Jeff here. And then as I started my process, knowing that we were gonna collaborate, I, I did a few paintings of his images and, um, kind of embellishing with wax and doing fun things with his images and um, loved it so much because I really thought I'd just do a few, you know, that kind of art. But, after, <laughs> but then, as you can see, I was so inspired by his work and by um, the emotion that he captures that I felt um, just incredibly inspired that I uh, kept going. And so a lot of um, Almost all of the images are his photographs where I just take it and you know, do a little caustic twist to it. That's my medium mainly. Um, and then I also uh, played a bit more, rouged myself um, artistically because I don't typically do still life, I don't typically do representational. I'm much more abstract. Um, but I thought, you know, his Women in the Mist just inspired me so much that it's like, I'm gonna. Give it my best and, <laughs> you know, put it out there. So that's kind of what art's about too, right? Not always just staying in your safe comfort zone, but pushing your limits and pushing your artistic expression. Um, so that was also part of that. Um, yeah, so I don't have as much to say because um, I feel like really it's Jeff's work that had, he has the stories, he has the, the experiences and the traveling. So I actually just kind of want to hand it over to him. But um, I'm super grateful to Abby for um, the opportunity to push my own self creatively and, um, and to have just a space to, to create you know, such beauty that you do as you, as you hang um, and curate spaces so, so lovely. So thank, thank you, you, Abby, and Jeff. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I feel humble. I mean, it's really great to be here, and thank you, Lori. I mean, I mean, very, very um, we have a lot of Lori's work at our house. As well. So <laughs> every time Shelly sees Lori, it's another five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you've been to our house, you know, you know that's true. But it, you, you're really amazing, and thank you to Abby. For just the opportunity and to be here. Um, back in back there is Anita. Anita uh, does a lot of our editing um, to the uh, word editing. So she kind of, I, uh, a lot of people don't know that I have a little bit of a disability like Avery where I'm not the best at like putting sentences together and paragraphs and things. So I can just spit that out into dictation and Anita can put that together for us. So she's done a great job um, with that. And then uh, Catherine is actually my is a photo editor for me, so um, and it does all the editing of the photos. So one, I thought I would tell you a little bit about how I do photographs um, because it's maybe a little unique in the fact that um, I take I had over thirty thousand photos um, a couple of years ago, been all over the world, and I never looked at them. I've never really hardly ever before a few years ago looked at the photos after I took them. I just, I, I, just, I don't know why, but I just didn't. And then I was at Mike's um, camera trying to, I was going to make a donation to a nonprofit of some of my photos and ran across Catherine and she said, oh my God, those are pretty good. And so I said, okay. <laughs> and, and then so she just went to town and she organized all my photos on Google Drive and started Editing. And I don't like a lot of editing, just so you know, I, mean, I like it so that it's just more pure. Um, and um, we try to um, do it so that, you know, that it's, um, I, I'm kind of a big believer. I'd rather have a, a good photo with a great story than a great photograph with no story. So, because to me, it's stories that are kind of, 
important group to that. So um, that's kind of that's about it. So and I'm, again, just grateful for Lori. I mean, if you um, one one other real quick thing, but I if you want to ask questions about photos or countries, I I um, I am prepared to talk about like maybe three countries that I've been to: uh, the Amazon, Papua New Guinea, and Ethiopia. That kind of it kind of gives a kind of a good representation of some of the work there, but um, I wanted to tell you kind of what it's like when you go to an indigenous country, you know, a culture, what it's like when you kind of step up uh, your, out of your car or your boat. And so there's a, a, a there's a photo of um, the Desanch, you might in southwestern Ethiopia, and it's near the Kenya border, so it takes a while to get there. It's actually with Shelly, that's why I wanted to share this, because she's not a woman, not, not Shelly, it's the first time that she ever went on a photo a photography trip with me. And so we took a, uh, there's a canal, we, we uh, uh, got a dug out canoe, we went to the, the Desanche, we'll just across the, just across the way a little bit on the border of Kenya. And um, so when they see a white person, an American coming there, you know, it's our foreign, um, they, they, it gets chaotic, like people will start running up to you. And it's, it's a uh, craziness and so, and it's beautiful too. It's you know, it's there's some beauty. I, I really was captured by the beauty of that lady. I mean, she's she'd be a model in a, in a, in America. I think she's just just beautiful. But so we just but anyway. So that so I just wanted to kind of, so we, we took this note out. Can you just kind of just visualize it? I have just my camera walking in to see this group, and there's probably thirty people, kids, and they're tugging on me, and you know, wanting just to talk to people, and you know. Um, and then you just you, you start just trying to figure out how to organize it. So, from a photography perspective, I'm trying. I'm always looking like where the light is, and you know, a lot of the time I get there at the worst time of the day, which is when the sun is right above you, right? And so, you just have to kind of go with that. And I never stayed anybody. I just try to do with the natural part of what's there, and that's been really important to me. So, um, anyway, that's that's what that's about. Uh, right there in the middle bottom, that's Chuma. Um, Tuma's about 80 years old. She's from the Matisse tribe in, on the Brazilian in How old did you say? 80, 80 years old. So this was kind of an interesting trip for me. And I, so I landed in, and I might be pronouncing this incorrect Spanish plus, but Matisse, Colombia. And it's called the Triple Corner because it's Colombia, Brazil, and Peru. And you, when you're going through the river uh, Ibarro, you're, you're in all those areas. You've already, so you're one side or the other. So what I hired a crew, I hired a cook, a, um, a person, a captain to drive the boat. We bought a bunch of gas, a lean, um, and we spent 10 days in the Brazilian and Colombian and Peruvian Amazon. And so this was, this family, so she's the major, actually, her husband's dead, she's eight year old, we're with her family. And so what we did, what did we do there? <laughs> well, you know, you're two or three days in the Amazon um, with this, just this one tribe. Um, we we went hunting, so they had these long blow darts with you know the poison on the tips, um, killed monkeys, um, and you know they skinned them. I have photographs of them skinning them, boiling them, eating them. I did not eat the monkey. I usually eat a lot of what they have. I get sick every time, but you know it's because uh, they 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 don't they don't like it when you don't participate, you know. But but you know I tend to you know it's probably a good thing. A funny kind of story about Tuma was her son was um, using a blow dart and was trying to kill a sloth and missed it, you know. And so the interpretation came back because they were all laughing. And Tuma said in her language, her native language, you know, how could you miss the slowest animal? In the hands of him? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, um, but it was really beautiful. We we actually developed a really good friendship um, there. Just you know, it was a really beautiful experience. And, um, they had uh, uh, Aussie berries that we ate, you know, going up and picking them. Um, and I counted, um, we stayed at hammocks. Um, that's what our, at night, you could hear the, like the cougars and the, you know, just the most amazing. I had 29 mosquito bites on my right hand. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's a good example of uh, uh, the Peruvian, you know, and, uh, and the Colombian Amazon. Mm -hmm. so, um, there's also, we, we also, it's super challenging, by the way, in the Amazon because, you know, there's, there's, there's a difference between contacted and uncontacted. Uncontacted, you know, there's like 50 uncontacted 
tribes throughout the world. About half of those are in the Amazon or more. And so you can't go see those, but we went to that, what we call isolated tribes. So that they have, they see very few foreigners. And so that's where we spent a lot of our time. Yeah. How do you know that they would have received you? Right. Yeah. How, do you, how, do, how, do how, how did you know they would let you participate in their life? Yeah, so we, so when, whenever I get, so we have, I have a crew uh, with me whenever I go someplace. So we, in this case, we go up to the shoreline and then one of our, one of the people that an interpreter would go up and then talk to the chief and then renegotiate. So for example, um, well, another tribe that I stayed with, we, um, we would give them gasoline and then mm -hmm. they would let us stay above the, the chicken coop. I stayed above the chicken coop for two nights and we barter, um, you know, and it's more of a name. Have you ever done Iowa, Iowa, Iowaska? Anybody? Iowaska, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it kind of comes out both ends and then you hallucinate. It does. But, it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, but that's that's kind of just general. And then you have to negotiate it. Um, it's not always easy, but that's kind of how that happens. So, the beginning of this trip starts how? Who are you contacting? Is it authorities, government, is it, hey, I'm coming down, <laughs> you got a place to stay kind of thing, I mean, what, Airbnb, you're right, I was say, <laughs> what, what's the process for getting, getting there, getting the permissions, and getting, yeah. I mean, because, so, wow. I do a lot of research when I get there, um, and then everything that you think is going to happen changes, yes, right. so, um, I had a, um, I was fortunate on this one, I was with a, I had a good connection. I made a good connection with a person through Lonely Planet out of all places. And yeah. um, that connection led to another connection. And then I put together the crew actually while I was in La Pisa. Mm -hmm. And it kind of all kind of assembled it there. I was I was in the middle of the Amazon and I, um, they were every time I go somewhere the people steal for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were seeing what they were doing. I didn't know it at the time I caught them. The, the, the people that I hired, they would take my the gas and then they would sell it to the people and then they get this money. So I kind of caught on to that. So I, and they called me Patron after that. And because um, I just stopped them in the middle of the boat and I just said, you can't do that anymore. You know? And so things like that kind of happen. But that, it just starts that, it just happens organic. You gotta be really willing to go with the flow. Okay. Um, that makes sense? It does make sense. It just, obviously there's a lot of trust things going on that, yeah, you've got, and, and, yeah, you got to hope they're not stealing everything and you're in the middle of the Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, and we were, uh, we the FUNAI, F-U-N-A-I is the port that's a, they kind of oversee the indigenous culture in the Amazon. So that was interesting permits that we had to get um, and things to kind of go where we, where we did, um, you know, something a little bit. Um, has anybody been to Papua New Guinea? Um, um, so let me just kind of give you a couple of highlights because it's it's a really fat it's probably one of the most fascinating countries I've really ever been to. Um, uh, so in Papua New Guinea, there's 800 different languages they speak pidgin. Um, so there the there's a the Sarel oh, Mundman, you see that in the middle there. The middle, the kind of, so that's in uh, Baroka, um, Middle Highlands, and uh, so what they do is they, this is kind of a ceremony that I was fortunate to see. So they, those are clay masks that they put on, um, and then they paint themselves with clay, and there's a, they, this is some, they do magic, black magic and spells. Um, there's a smoky fire kind of as they do things. The claws are made out of bamboo, um, and long spears, and um, we just had a really kind of a good time. That was a good, that, that's called the spy man that's coming out right there. Um, the Huli Widow are kind of interesting. Um, the Huli, so when, when you're, uh, so men have all the power they think they do in, in Papua New Guinea. And uh, so when a man dies in Papua New Guinea, in this area, uh, the, the wife, the women move to a separate little village. It's a, and and uh, they're away from the rest of the um, everybody else in the tribe during that breathing period. But what they do is they they chop their husbands up into three pieces when they're dead. And they have this, like, um, this, this sticks that come out of the ground, and there's this basket 
with their body in it, right, mm -hmm. chopped up. And there's a low, um, low burning fire that's mostly smoking underneath it. And, and then that decay comes down into, they can't leave that their husband until that bottom. All the flesh is, they can't shower, they can't do anything until all those bones are just, that's all that's left there, so. Do they dissect them? To make it more convenient to, to put burn. It in. It's not like a no. ritualistic third. It's just to put them in the back. Gotcha. Yeah. So they, the, the, act, the women actually chop their husbands up. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, and of course, I didn't see that, but I was, I did for, I did. Uh, there were three of them at the time in the village that I went to. What if a woman does? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, the, the, yeah. Yeah. so do they? Okay, just be really like. Let's just go there. So if they're putting the guy in this basket well, and, yeah, yeah. and they're turning him into a stew, there there is a lot of ingestion of like brains and Well they're not they're not eating them. So so that's no, not they just, it. they're not sustaining his life by ingesting them. No, he's already dead. He's died. They chop the bodies up and they put them in a basket over a fire, very slow, that they have to tend to for about a year. And then to all the uh, years, so they, so they, they can't turn it out with just one. Yeah, they're not going to do that. What do they do once they go back to the earth to fertilize it? What is the purpose of that? That's just a cultural thing, Ram. And it's just it's just what they do. The the women, um, so they they actually won't. They're very afraid that their their husbands are going to come back in a spirit form if they don't do this and and kill them somehow. So, count twice. Okay, it would be because I'm giving some more to Sarah's stuff. Okay, follow, follow, keep going. Okay, all right. So there's there's a couple of rituals that are so, and I I do have photographs. I did not put them here that are uh, uh, cane swallowing and tongue bleeding. So you got to follow me on this one a little bit. So the the men kind of believe that the mother's uh, postpartum blood is still inside when they're born. And so they want to, they try to expel that. So one of the things that they do is they take these long canes and they stick them into their stomach yeah. until it, it, all the way down until it bleeds and until that's uh, excreted out. And they do the same thing with their tongues. I do have photographs of that, might even be on Instagram, but, um, so that's a very interesting part of their culture um, that they do. Um, and then they have a big feast after that. It's, uh, do they do this? At, I'm sorry. How old are fascinated? Uh -huh. <laughs> do they do this when they're babies? When they're no, they're, they're men. Or? They're adult men. They're um, they're yeah, um, they're adult men usually, probably young adult men. So coming young young adults, adults, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. There's got to be some language disconnection if I wouldn't say you're not barrier because you got some transition. Yeah. But how how do you do this? Stories translated. I mean, there's got to be a lot of yeah. lore, and, yeah. and then you must have layer after layer after layer of questions to make sure you're hearing it right. How do you get these translations really understood? So these are all factual stories. So this I researched before I went there. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew all this before I went there, and then I went. My goal was to seek out to, to photograph those experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's you can Google that, and you can probably find it. I, you know, that's just how I've done it. In the past, and then you know, you hit or miss, you know, sometimes it works. So, do you have a translator with you then? Every well, yes, but it's not always, you know. Um, yeah, it's everything's there. <laughs> I think that was what was so fascinating. I would hear these stories when Jeff would return, and uh, I knew that this, we had these goals of yeah. going and photographing the indigenous people, and um, it's there's so much. Oh my gosh, so much. And, and you're gonna do a book? I'm gonna do an art book. And so, so if I could be a little vulnerable here, so uh, <laughs> with you all, um, you know, I think that uh, I, I wonder, I, I, I mean, really, actually this this gallery has forced me to figure out a name for my book. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't talked to the two most important people that have been helping with it yet, <laughs> but uh, I think I'm gonna call it a mm -hmm. And I like one word names for books. and. So when I'm in the States and kind of in my daily routine, I don't feel alive, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You kind of, I work a lot, I, I feel lonely sometimes, I'm stressed out, I, mm -hmm. you know, all these different things that just come up in life, you know? But 
when I when I go overseas and I and you've got it, you you come alive, right? You just and it's so it's such a beautiful thing for me. And I I've always told people that when things are at their worst, I'm at my best. And I also feel like when there's chaos, like I just I I just I just love it. Like it's just this part of me, and I I actually feel that peace and that kind of that in the and those more kind of chaotic moments, you know. So that's where I'm gonna, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna, but we, my idea is to get people to, to understand because the, the view and hopefully get people to do more traveling, to go over to these places that are hard to get to. Um, just to, you know, I have a view that, one of my favorite words is the word ethnocentric, you know, it's the, the word that, you know, we all kind of, we all kind of have our own view of life. And then when you go to a different culture and you see something a little bit different, that makes you think, and you and you cannot be in. You, you're going to come back, and you're going to be impacted by that, right? It's going to change you, no matter what. And so, the first time I saw the Hammer Tribe in southwestern Ethiopia, they they have a ritual. It takes a month, but it's a brutal process. We have a lot of women, but they hear that the men actually whip the women with these leather um, whips, and, and and their their belief is that it it um, it it, it, it um, it helps their boys become men. It's a ritual. So there's a lot of ceremony. They have all their family come in. They kill an animal or two. And, um, you know, they're, they're on whatever name of drugs that they have, so they're not feeling any pain. But they're, I, I've seen this one. You know, they're with, their backs are bleeding. They've got scars. I didn't put any of those on. But um, the, and, 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 it's, and it, it changes you. That's all I can tell you. It just, and you see that, and uh, see the first time I got sick, the first time I saw it, the second time I didn't. But, and uh, so it was just uh, being vulnerable again. If you want me to be vulnerable, I, mean, I can share this with you. So, um, the very first time that I saw this, so I, I got sick and I was just mad. And, and, and I, I don't, this is kind of your own view, okay? So please, let's understand this. But the, you know, this the the, the the interpreter said, How 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 can you think that our culture is bad when in America, you know, um, abortion is legal, right? And I'm not saying if you're pro life or you know or not, but it just it makes you think, right? Because these are diff just different cultural things and so you know, what what's right or wrong? I can't, I'm not gonna try it's to a different lens it's, it's, really Yeah. Different. So yeah. Well I uh, kind of around it. There's a lot of academic study on, you know, where mankind resides and their thought processes and, you know, are they benevolent or they malevolent, you know, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, everyone's kind of, you know, analysis on, wow, they think man is like this, good, or they think man is inherently bad, and, and none of it's exactly right, none of it's exactly wrong, but it's all a bunch of chatter from the intellectual side. Generally speaking, when you go into these, I'm just going to call them wild cultures that are not civilized, like we understand civilization. Indigenous. You know? Indigenous, wild area. Yeah. Do you ever get a feeling like these people are generally good, spirited, kind, empathetic, or do you feel like they're yeah. not trusting and looking to take advantage? Is there an opinion when you go into these regions yeah. where you feel about they're that? They're just like a just like us, mm -hmm. yeah, they, mo their majority of them are just beautiful, wonderful people. Mm -hmm. Even in, you know, some.